just now of Andrew Coven, Lord and Emperor of the Coven Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue my discussion on the clans and bloodlines of Vampire the Masquerade in the World of Darkness. Sorry if you hear storming in the background. I don't have extra time to record this, and there's a storm going on in the background. So, apologies, I wanted to make sure to get this video out on time. But regardless, let's dive into today's episode. I'm going to talk about another bloodline of Vampire the Masquerade. Today I have the Ramanga who are one of the legacy of Libon, the African bloodlines of vampires. There's theorized, because of one of their abilities, that they might be connected to the Lysambra, but it's hard to say for sure. They have the disciplines of Isinia, which is effectively of tenebration, hence the connection to the Lysambra, obfuscate, and presence. Now, it is important to note they were only active during the Dark Ages, at least that was the last time they were known. Now, if we tell the story of how they originated, it goes to one of the island nations off, saw, off the shore of Africa. We focus on a brother, brother and sisters, Ramanga and Rafazi. This island was a patriarchal society, and Ramanga was the oldest child, the older sister. But her younger brother, Rafazi, was the heir, the sire. She was, of course, smarter and stronger than her brother, and did not understand why she could not take the throne. So she instead turned to dark spirits in order to gain her more power, to get her more blessings, to have her take over. She, of course, started with the general spirits, those of lesser power, making a sacrifice to them. But as time went on, the spirits she sacrificed to got darker and darker, and the sacrifices she made the same. Eventually, a spirit came to her and told her that she could give her what she wanted, give her the power that she wanted, but she must give up her son. She was so desperate at this point, she was willing to do it. And over the course of seven days, she changed. She learned the secrets of shadows, of illusions, but she also lost her son. The spirit told her one other thing, though. That the real power behind the throne lies not in sitting on the throne, but those that have the ruler's ear, the advisors, those who can manipulate the ruler with her newfound abilities, the abilities to both manipulate, not only give orders, but have people obey them, she went out and she went to her brother. Her brother took the rulership and she became an advisor. Such a great advisor that led the kingdom to know of her name as much as her brother's name, of many kingdoms, and for this kingdom here to evolve, to change, that now they would revere queens over kings into the future. She secured the fact that not only her brother, but her brother's dis bloodline, his descendants, would all look to her for advice and her kin. Now we move in the Dark Ages, we've seen that one island wasn't enough to quell Ramanga's ambition. She wanted control, in a way, over greater and greater areas. So she sent out her childhood to be advisors in various places to spread her influence that they had the ears of rulership. She carefully kept the island under out of naval areas so that no one would really come to influence them and that she had a relative safety there. But from this safety net, she was able to influence and spread her connections throughout much of Africa and even into the Middle East. She was one of the bloodlines of Africa that had major connections within the Middle East and even would run into some of the kindred there. Though her power was mainly within the eastern and southern parts of Africa, we did see that she did manage to gain a good foothold in northern Africa and even in the Middle East with the way that her influence was and the influence of her bloodline. She was actively involved with her bloodline, making sure that everything was going smoothly, all the manipulations were going smoothly. Now, whether the exact reason for this constant want to expand influence, expand power. Rumor does say that perhaps the dark deal that she met giving up her son, there was a little more to it. Now, whether or not this bloodline actually survived post the Dark Ages with the changes and things, how they worked within Africa in that part of the world, is hard to say. We don't know of any of them leaving into the modern nights. It does not necessarily mean they've gone extinct, though. Her and her child's fate are unknown. Now, the Ramanga typically had the facade of a loyal servant. They would give themselves to a king or a queen and be a humble advisor to them, giving them information, feeding them information. They might even live amongst the other servants to give a facade of that they are actually a member of the court, that they are willing to be it. 
Now the fact is, from this position, they would manipulate the ear of the king and queen. Now, this isn't to say that some kings and queens didn't know what they were. Some were privy to the information of what these creatures that were now serving them were. Most of them saw them as a, effectively a supernatural lightning rod, bringing all the dark supernatural abilities and bad luck to them in particular, and keeping them away from the king and queen. What they didn't know is they would put themselves in a position at this point in time that they particularly have the ear of the king and king. They appear as just a loyal servant. But truly, the words that go into the king's ear, or the queen's ear, and the words that they listen to, are their words. The words that they choose. They're really the ones in charge. Now, most Ranga maintained two havens. A haven that they could meet with the king, meet with the royalty, a place that the royalty could meet with them, communicate with them, connect with them. And then another haven, which was their sanctuary, the place that they would rest, a place that was kept safe and more hidden. As part of the service that Ranga would offer, they would drink the blood of various nobles and important people within the court in order to remove curses from them. Effectively, this eliminated their ability to, or the need for them, to hunt. They would have a group of people all but willing to share the blood to get rid of curses or negative effects on them. When they would move into a new area, they would oftentimes quickly be able to find a group of people that they could serve in order to remove the curses and darkness that have been poxing them. Now, Ramanka was actually oftentimes the first bloodline within the Liban European canines would meet. These were the ones that they would encounter first and foremost. They would offer themselves to these new visitors to the land as assistance and help. The thing is, though, should they find themselves refusing this help, sometimes they would find themselves out in a place where, well, the sun will be meeting them in the morning, when they should be asleep and safe. So you can see that, though, they were willing to help out these new neighbors, new visitors. You'd be best not to cross with them. It's best to take up friendly advice. Now, the embraces of a Rob Manga were actually a closely mediated thing. They would look for someone that was ambitious, that had a lot of manipulative power, but attempted to stay out of the spotlight. Those were the type of people they looked to. They would actually even look to those that they would be able to grab folks within this bloodline that seemed to show things, and they would raise them up. They basically would manipulate these people from birth to get to this position. They weren't against doing that, manipulating entire bloodlines in order to find people to embrace that they have tailored them to their whim. Once these folks are embraced, though, then they stay with their sire for centuries. A couple of centuries learning everything they need to know. Now, this isn't to say that the relationship between them isn't amicable. Things could break down, things could go wrong, but there is always this respect between them. They always do have that connection because of the amount of time they put. Whether after this time period is done, they don't want to see each other ever again, especially the child, eh? Or they will tend to work together, spend time together afterwards. will be entirely up to how things ended up after that couple of centuries. So they always do keep connections to each other. They always are very close to each other, regardless if it's more friendly or not. Now, the weakness of the Ramanga has to do with their two powers, presence and Aizana, or a tenebration. If they attempt to use any of these powers on someone other than themselves, they have a more difficult time than normal, unless they have a physical piece of the person that they're going to be using the ability on. This seems to stem from their need to insert themselves in both mortal and kindred society and basically manipulate them from behind the scenes. They need to have this connection in order to get in there. They have to be in this position where they are inserted to manipulate. And the Ramanga themselves would meet occasionally, would have great organizations where they would gather together and discuss the various things that are going on, plans that are being enacted, the state of everything that's going on. They would have elaborate ceremonies which were meant to not only unify them, but to distract from various things, from rivalries and other problems that might occur between the various groups when amongst here, in order to keep everything relatively peaceful. There was a lot of these ceremony to everything, so everybody's distracted with ceremony when discussing everything to focus on their rivalries. It is important to note, though, that any time internal collaboration occurred amongst the Ramanga, it's a force to be reckoned with. Once the bloodline as a whole decides to do something, 
they all decide to do it. They are very unified when it comes to these decisions. So not only do you have to mess with one, so you mess with basically the plans of, an, of a Ramanga, you might find all the Ramanga going against you. But that's it for today. I introduced you to the Ramanga, an interesting bloodline that might be of the La Sombra, might not. Regardless, we don't know if they're in the modern day. We haven't seen them. If they're there, they might just be hidden, manipulating important people even now, within Africa, within the world, within the shadows, still connected together, but hidden enough that most of us, all of us, don't know they're there. Or they could all be dead. We don't know. We may never know. It's impossible to say for sure if we're ever going to learn of the truth of the Ramanga, an interesting legacy of Libon. But if you have any questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please leave in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe. It's just for the channel, the empire, the work I do. If you want to show some extra support, you can always check out my Patreon. Link description below. There's some great rewards there. It helps to grow and improve the channel and the empire. But regardless, until the next time, I bid you farewell.